Hey, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Richard Moses. <laughs> Richard Moses. And uh, <clears throat> I'm with the Low East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we're an all-volunteer, uh, not-for-profit group dedicated to preserving through New York City Landmark Historic District designation, the historic Lower East Side, an area that traditionally included East Village, Lower East Side below Housing Street, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. Lesby focuses on preserving these neighborhoods' historic streetscapes because historically life on the Lower East Side was, was and still is lived in the streets. A few years ago, Lesby along with Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and other groups, worked hard to get two East Village Historic Districts passed, one along 2nd Avenue and the other on East 10th Street on the north side of Tompkins Square Park. That was a great success. Now Lesby is focused on getting Historic Districts passed on the, pass on the Lower East Side below Delancey Street and, Ch and Chinatown. Both of these neighborhoods have amazing architectural and cultural history that desperately need historic district protection. As anyone who has been through the landmarking process knows, getting an historic district passed is no easy feat. The Real Estate Board of New York, Rebney, is one of our most powerful opponents. Rebney is only interested in building new buildings bigger and higher. Recently, Rebney started an anti-preservation campaign that portrayed preservation and the love of historic architecture and community history as elitist, stodgy, and Disney-esque. None of this is true. To combat this mischaracterization, we at Lesby decided to create a book using contemporary photography to show how the historic East Village is a vibrant, very much alive area loved by all. That's what brought us to publishing East Village, Lens of the Lower East Side, and thereby brought us together tonight. I want to first very gratefully thank Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, including Andrew Berman, Matthew Morowitz, and Harry Bubbins for sponsoring and putting together the event uh, tonight. I also want to thank uh, Marilyn Appleberg, who I'll be introducing in a minute, uh, the book's author, who has gone way above and beyond in her help for the book, um, <clears throat> and the book's six photographers, including those here tonight, Karen Telly, Marlies Mumber, George Hirose, and Ono Dijon. Ono, who also did the book's exceptional graphic design, has been an amazing help to Lesby over the years. Finally, I want to thank our Lesby board of directors and advisors, and especially Carolyn Radcliffe, who I'll be introducing also, I believe, in a minute, <laughs> I think, uh, both as Lesby vice president and as director of our Lowy Cider for her central role in making this book happen. One more thing, please stay tuned uh, for Lesby's next Lens on the Lower East Side books, which will cover Chinatown and the Lower East Side below Houston Street. So right now I want to introduce Marilyn Appleberg. Marilyn is a, a longtime East Village resident and community activist. She helped form the East 10th Street and Stuyvesant Center Street Block Association and has led the organization as president for many years. She has fought against inappropriate and out-of-scale development projects along 3rd and 2nd Avenues, developed a merchants association for the neighborhood, and organizes a yearly block party to raise funds for block beautification projects. Marilyn is perhaps best known for revitalizing what is now Abe Lebowell Park, the open area facing St. Mark's Church in the Bowery on 2nd Avenue, Stuyvesant Street, and East 10th Street. She's the author of East Village, Lens on the Lower East Side. So let's give her a warm welcome. Historic District was designated. And talking about 47 years ago, and Richard mentioned how difficult it is to designate a district. And there's somebody here who was instrumental in doing that, and I want to recognize him, Bob Keane. You, you have to understand, first of 
well, it was so thrilling. I, my apartment looked like the set of La Boheme. It was as cold, and my parents were horrified, and my boss said he would pay me more money if I moved to a safer neighborhood. Oh, okay. I was so happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but they designated this district with no famous names, no money, no clout, and no preservation organizations. And it was going to take another 47 years for another historic district to be designated in our area. And it, and it took a lot more of a fight. And Leslie is to be congratulated on that. Um, Richard came to me and asked me, I, I'm the author of a, a lot of guidebooks, city guidebooks, and he asked me to write a brief um, introduction to a photo essay book. And um, I said, okay, I'll do that. And this was the first paragraph. Uh, and I, I'm going, even though it really, um, when we're talking about the history of the area, it really was always called the Lower East Side until about 1960 when it, it, uh, it varies between it was real estate interests or it was the New York Times who first used the phrase Village East or East Village. But for clarity, I am going to use the term East Village through, um, throughout. So um, I said, OK, I'm, I'll, I'll write about this. So this was the first paragraph. One can easily make the case that few neighborhoods or even some small countries have had as long a history and undergone as many transformations as the East Village. Although some decades were the best of times and there were times when things could not get any worse, the East Village has often been down, but it has never been out. It took a little over 350 years to go from Dutch Farm to the pierced belly button of New York, but what a fascinating 350 years it has been. So I'm thinking I'm supposed to hand in two pages, 350 years, two pages. Mm -hmm. The two pages turned into 13,663 words. <laughs> and oh no, uh, the Jong, who was the designer of the book, was the first person. He wanted to see some text before he laid out the book. And um, I owe it to him because he was the one who went to Richard and told him it's going to be a different book. <laughs> so, and I, I have to say, when I thought about who could I leave out, you can't leave out the Dutch, of course. It started, it started with them. And we owe a great deal to the Dutch, because if they hadn't gotten here first, we would have been another Boston, which absolutely, <laughs> there's no question about it. And the British, he gave up to the British without a fight, and I think either laziness or gratitude, but they kept everything that the Dutch put in place. And um, Holland and Amsterdam were very liberal places, very tolerant places, although Peter Stuyvesant drew the line at, at several groups that he, um, was not crazy about, uh, chief among them, the Jews, um, when I think it was 24 shipwrecked uh, Jews were picked up by a Dutch, Dutch ship and brought to New York, he declared he had a Jewish problem. Um, tried to get the Dutch West India Company to um, expel them, and was reminded that many of the board of directors on the Dutch, his boss, the Dutch West India Company, were Jews, and so he relented. And a couple of the funny things that I found out when I was doing this book that couldn't go into the book was every single group, every single area, practically every block has a story, and it could have been a far longer book. But the Yiddish Art Theater, uh, which is a survivor of the, the theatrical life of the Jewish community, in the cornerstone of that theater is a photograph of um, uh, a likeness of Maury Schwartz, Schwartz uh, who built that theater, and they also put in a picture of Peter Stuyvesant <laughs> into the courtesan, so they could be together <laughs> forever. <laughs> um, so I couldn't, you couldn't leave out the Dutch, um, and it's our historic, the St. Mark's Historic District that basically um, encompasses a lot of the Dutch uh, uh, parts of, of, uh, of the East Village. And, then, and you can't leave out the Irish and their contributions in terms of the maritime industry. Um, and this was something I learned about when in the fight for St. Bridget's, um, the Irish community there. There was a maritime community that went from 12th Street down to Grand Street. 
and it lasted until the 1930s. There was a shipyard called Sullivan's that um, started in 1859 and was still going in 1930, and a little old guidebook talks about the Irish and Hebrew children that ran from after school to kind of play around and learn things in the shipyard. So then there you have the Irish, and of course St. Bridget's was, was saved. Um, the German community that came was the largest um, German-speaking community outside of Germany and Austria. And, uh, and it contributed so much, and it was their, their uh, they were the beginnings of the trade unions that they brought with them. Um, they brought delicatessens, that's a, that's a German um, import. Um, and it was such a, a lively and vibrant community until, of course, the, the, the General Slocum um, disaster, mm -hmm. which was the biggest disaster in New York uh, until, the, until the World Trade Center, and they left. Um, the Jews, the Lower East Side is the Jews, Plymouth Rock. And it's kind of nice that the Yiddish Rialto was right, out, right outside the gate of where, where Stuyvesant is buried. Um, those theaters were marvels inside, and if you haven't been to a movie in the, um, in the Yiddish Arts the Theater, which is the Village Arts on, on 2nd Avenue, the interior is designated, and it's, and it's um, spectacular. And then, of course, the, the uh, Ukrainians, and we, we still have wonderful food, pierogi and all of the rest of it, and a very strong Ukrainian community still. And of course the Puerto Ricans who came and made Lowy Sida, like made that part of uh, the world theirs, and who suffered the most during the economic downturn and all of the drugs. And I came out of the book with such extraordinary respect for people who endured the worst of, of the 70s and 80s, and, um, and, and, and came out with, and fought back with gardens, with flowers, with murals, um, and, and, and kept their dignity. And um, that, that was a very, very strong um, impression that I came, came away with. And the, the book was, was an extraordinary joy to write because I, I felt as if, and people have said this to me, it's as if I had gotten on top of a, onto a, a magic carpet and I was looking at an overview of 350 years of this one relatively small space and came away with more of a conviction than ever that the work of Leslie, and I am, um, I am on the advisory board of Leslie, um, that, that saving, it's wonderful to save an individual building, and you know, thank heaven we saved the, the Ottendorfer Library and the, and the dispensary and the old merchant's house, but to save a street, to do what they did with 330 buildings in the, lower, the East Village Lower East Side uh, Historic District, it's nothing short of a miracle because it's really important to be able to see it and not just read about it. Um, I would just say that it, after doing the, the history and thinking, well, I have to talk about the arts in, our, in the community and um, the tradition, and a big part of it started with, um, with uh, William Guthrie, who was a pastor of, of uh, St. Mark's when they lost their fashionable congregation. And um, he had parishioners uh, like Cahill Gibran and, and uh, Auden, and um, uh, Isadora Duncan danced there, scandalized the congregation by dancing barefoot. Um, and the, the arts continue there, but they're in the, the, the Fourth Street and, and the theaters, and Ellen Stewart and the Negro Ensemble Company, and everything that started here and still goes on here. You have to talk about that. Um, and activism. I, I did a chapter called The Long Good Fight, um, and I, I'm just going to read you this, the beginning of that. Activism at work is a word long associated with the East Village. So our protest, resiliency, individualism, diversity, tolerance, notwithstanding, die up be scum, creativity, and adaptability. Many of these words are reflected with the waves of immigrant groups that have resided here and have left their mark. It is in the neighborhood's DNA. Uh, so you have to celebrate the arts and there's still so much of it still here. You have to get involved. And I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna do a, a commercial for preservation before I, before, I, um, before I tie it up. 
Um, rent strikes, demonstrations, sit-ins, pressure on legislators, squatting, and homesteading are all tools that have been used in the past to save a community with a nearly unbroken history of residential and commercial usage spanning over 350 years. In recent years, as gentrification has intensified, activists and advocates in the East Village have turned to historic preservation as a way to protect people and property. Through the recognition and per preservation of the area's amazingly diverse collection of historic, often highly ornate architecture, an important story gets told not only of the East Village, but through it of our immigrant nation. If the tenement walls could talk, what a story they would tell, and in how many languages would we told. Sorry. Um, I want to introduce now Carolyn Radcliffe. Uh, Car Carolyn is the Vice President and Events Chair at the Lower East uh, Side Preservation Initiative at Leslie. Um, one thing that's not in this bio is that Carolyn was really instrumental in getting us uh, off the ground. Uh, we were a very small group and uh, we had meetings in our office. Uh, Britton Bain, who's here, is, uh, is another co-founder of, of Lesby, and we had uh, very uh, sporadic and informal meetings and somehow my memory is getting a little sparse but Carolyn showed up one night the next thing we knew we had a full website and a beautiful brochure designed by by Ono and we were like a really bo a real bona fide organization so uh, I really uh, want to emphasize her central role uh, and formative role in, in Lesby over the years uh, she, she was also the executive director of La Plaza Cultural Community Park and Garden from 1995 to 2003. And while there, she founded and directed the La Plaza Cultural Performance Festival from 1996 until 2003. She founded Art Artista Saloi Saida in 1995 with Mario Bustamante and Robert Slaughter when they mounted two art shows and storefronts on Avenue B and C in conjunction with Earth Celebration's Rite of Spring pageant. They continue to show the work of various Lower East Side East Village artists. In 2008, Carolyn, Mario Bustamante, and Ona DeJong incorporated Art Lower East Side Foundation as a nonprofit, and she has continued to organize art exhibits, screenings, garden events, and monthly church children's art classes <coughs> at Tompkins Square Library. Carolyn is also the president of the board for the Lower East Side Performance Project, on the steering committee for the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and the chair of the, of the 9BC Tompkins Square Park Association. She serves as the chair of the Landmark Subcommittee as well as the Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee and the Arts and Culture Task Force, CB3. Her photographs and articles have been published in The Villager and City and shown in all the shows organized by Artistas de Lower East Side and our Lower East Side Foundation as well as solo shows at Tompkins Square Library and Planet One Cafe. She, is also, she also operates as a development consultant for downtown music productions, the Lower East Side Performing Arts, and the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. So let's uh, welcome Carolyn. Just to correct a couple of things, I am the chair of the Arts and Culture Subcommittee, not Landmarks. I'm on the Landmarks Committee. I was the chair, but there was a trade-off, and I became the chair of the Arts and Culture uh, because of my involvement with the arts community here. Uh, basically, I'm here to introduce the photographers, and not so much to talk about myself. Um, I know all of these photographers, um, through activism, through the gardens, mostly, um, and art shows. Um, the first person that I want to introduce is Anna de Jong, who is a longtime friend, and um, has done a tremendous amount of work for preserving this neighborhood. Ono did all the graphics for the Committee to Save St. Bridget without his incredible posters, his brochures, his advice, we would never have that church. It would have been a pile of rubble. And it's just sort of like, um, I guess what my main role is, I'm really good at bugging people to do things. And sometimes I can drive people absolutely crazy um, with that because I am very persistent, um, as many people know. 
So at any rate, I'd like to introduce Arnold first. He's an artist, a photographer, a web and graphic designer, filmmaker, and author. He teaches web design at Parsons New School and is the owner of Circular Creation, a web and graphic design company. He is the vice president of Art Loisaida Foundation, a local arts nonprofit, and is a longtime East Village resident who has been active in supporting preservation of the arts, the environment, and community gardening in this neighborhood and has generously donated his talents for many local endeavors to preserve our neighborhood. I'd like to introduce Fonada John. His images are composed of all the classical elements that make up the uh, photographic medium. The beauty of his work is fused by soft and sharp focus, relaying the tenderness and at times a tough, gritty composition. Tully's work, while captured from the street, is not about the street. There is an abstract painterly quality about it that conveys a feeling of beauty and a lighthearted airiness that suggests a deep-seated love for his adopted city, New York City. Kieran Tully. Escalator up all the way 
and just shoot through the glass. So I went up there, got a big piece of black material, I taped it to the window, and I went, got in behind it to stop all the reflections. So I shot through the glass and I got the W Hotel with Union Square in the foreground. I and mean, it absolutely nuts about it. And that led to a ton of other jobs that I got. And it also led to me not wanting to repeat my style. Like, I had to show all these buildings, and I just didn't want to do them all the same way. Um, I had great access like, to the top of um, the Helmsley building, right up in the cuckoo's nest. I was up there. Um, I asked the and said, yes, you can go anywhere you want. Um, because I was working for the management company. And so I went up and I shot Park Avenue from there. That's not here because it's supposed to be East Village. Um, but I didn't like the photograph because it just it looked very ordinary. So I did I took the image and I moved it at least 30 times. It moved it like about an inch. And I created a brand new image. It's very abstract, and it's, I call it Park Gallery. I originally called it industry, because all the people in their little offices were like doing whatever. But the name didn't really stick, I think Park Gallery was a better name. And, um, and that's what I did. I just... Can we see I the next see images? It. Yeah. Okay. There's a machine over here, you gotta point oh. to the machine. Okay. No, uh, right. well, oh, sorry, okay. So that's that's that shot. I love that shot. Okay. This is the bean a coffee shop on 9th Street and First Avenue. And uh, I also like shooting in the snow. <laughs> and I love dogs. <laughs> and this guy um, he was, let's see, how shall I say it? He'd taken a pee here, and, or a dump, one or the other, but he, he relieved himself, and he was extremely happy. <laughs> and you can't even tell me, he tell him in the print, he's got little red socks on. He's, he's, he's a dog. So that's my job. And I also like the building. They have like clouds painted on it. Mm -hmm. And so that was snow. This is the East Village uh, meat market. And um, it's an old building. And I mean, I get my buy like all my food, food in there and stuff. I always wanted to photograph it. And one Saturday, shortly, shortly after Christmas, And I basically just, I just saw it and I shot it and that was it. Mm -hmm. So, um, these guys, the butchers are in here, they're actually waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this guy just standing there smoking a cigarette, looking like whatever he was looking for. And then this girl was just walking that way. So. <laughs> Me. It's yeah. a very fine butcher too, right? It That's is, it. yeah. 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 If you don't know. Yeah. It's the only one left. There used to be one yeah, of the there anywhere else you find a butcher shop. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, the drugstore on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street. And so this photograph, what I loved about this shop, originally before it, I shot it, was the drug sign, drugs and cosmetics in neon, absolutely beautiful, beautiful old sign. But the street I wasn't, really wasn't that pretty. Um, and there's also a lot of trucks and stuff parked here. And, and this is a problem generally shooting city is how do you get rid of trucks um, and signs and, and trash? And really you have to work them into your shop. You have to make them work because you can't get rid of them. Um, so my solution sometimes is to do this. Is it's the same one image that is superimposed upon itself and it's moved out of, reg out of registration and it creates a painted effect. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of you know it's a bit of it's 
kind of like paint, except you're using a screen. Like I, mean, I use Photoshop. And so it's the closest I can get to being painted. Um, and in the print, the sky is a beautiful, like, kind of warm, overcast color. Um, and yeah, it's a beautiful shot. And this guy is crossing the street. I'm not sure if I dropped him in or if he was there. I think he was there. Sometimes I put people in. But they're in, the, they're in the scene, they're just in a different frame. So I'm giving it all to this. This shot is beautiful. Um, it's um, throwback vintage. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <gone. laughs> That's your goal. So I was asked by Carolyn is to go ahead and create the book, and they had someone else to kind of write the thing. And, you know, I, I didn't know what to do, and um, I, they gave me pictures of two, I mean, three photographers, and I was looking through the pictures and said, this is not a book. And I had to throw my, my name out, at least I wanted to have some integrity. And so that's where I know that they, one person fell through the head. I mean, you were writing it, and you were starting to play with it. So I said, yeah, I said, Take it, take it away. Do what you gotta do. And I'll shield you from it. <laughs> I'll make sure he doesn't bother you. So that's you know part of the why is that whole story. So and because I was I was also one of the photographers, um, I many of my pictures were kind of um, there, I was filling in gaps that I thought needed to be filled in once you look at all the other photographers. Um, so this was happening right, this is happened to be on Light Street. Um, it's a great, great title for a story, great title for a picture opposite of the history of, of the East Village. So that's kind of why that, that's what happened to have been there. Um, let's see what else is there. None of that was We got other buttons? With those four? Battery type. <laughs> we are stuck. <laughs> stuck in the past. So one of the benefits of you know cre helping create the work is I had. Oh. So um, one of the things I really I, 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 I yeah I've been here for a long time and then I got a child and I realized that one of the transformations that's happened in East Village is the possibility of raising a child in a way that that really wasn't possible when I first. You know, in the 80s, I mean, you could do it, of course, but it didn't have any support systems available. So I wanted to include his whole family pictures. This is a friend of mine who happened to take a picture of it, and I just thought it was very much, you know, this is the East Village now, where you get much more family. And I don't know if the think you guys are So um, the other one was, I know there's a big youth culture that really revitalized and, and, and you know, comes on Friday and Saturday night and, and trash in place, but it's, you know, but the whole, um, and the skateboarding park and everything else. So these are actually pictures I, I dug up from, oh, I don't know, quite a few years ago. But I wanted to get some of the, some of the, some of the youth skateboarding activities in there. Can go to the next scene. Um, this is my view from the window of a hallway, where it's, uh, the windows, you know, typically like maybe all the windows in the and things on the inside, and it gives a nice, uh, it's from first and ninth, so you see this is, yes, to kind of looking up to the East Village. I thought it was a very, it's a very nice shot. I like it. It's kind of moody. Um, next. So, oh, okay, George. So, I'd like to introduce George Rose, who is a gardener, photographer, uh, and George is currently an associate professor of photography at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. He is a lifetime New Yorker who grew up in the Bronx and has lived in downtown Manhattan since 1979. He has dedicated much of his life to public service and is a community gardener at the Children's Magical Garden in the Lower East Side. He is also the president of the New York chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League 
America's oldest Asian civil rights advocacy group founded in 1929. As an artist, his photographs have been exhibited in many one-person and group shows nationally and abroad. He also documents works of art, exhibitions, events, installations, public programming for several nonprofit organizations in New York City, including the Japan Society, the Noguchi Museum, and Henry Street Settlement. George? part of this project, um, that, you know, just to be able to illustrate Marilyn's wonderful, insightful, illuminating uh, text with, you know, uh, just an amazing thing. So I think it really uh, uh, gives you a, a chronological uh, sense of, of how this, uh, you know, neighborhood has evolved uh, physically and psychologically, and it actually leaves you with some kind of optimism. It leaves you at the end with feeling that, oh, this is still a great place, you know. You can complain about what's happened to East Village all you want to, but you know, it's our home, so we, we really need to embrace everything that's changed. And the best thing we can do is actually help educate people about what the legacy and all the layers of history uh, we have here. So it's, it's, to me, it's a very special, special place. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, and uh, uh, downtown New York and East Village, East Village didn't exist, as I mentioned, as that Mal mentioned, uh, was, was kind of a magnet for me. You know, there was this, this you know, it was a subway ride away, it was like a one hour subway ride, but you know, every chance I could get when I was starting when I was like 13, 14, I would jump in the subway. My parents had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I would just come down and I would just hang out in East Village. If I was drawn, I'd call the break in the Fillmore and uh, the kind of music was a place for the rock bands. It was all about rock and roll and being rebellious and you know, it was just, it had this sort of mystique to it. And I still feel that way about it because, you know, it hasn't really changed. Um, the, uh, at some point, I, I don't know how this happened, but I became an old timer, right? I don't know when. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's so, you know, but I, you know, but I enjoyed that aspect of, you know, being able to, uh, you know, be part of the community and, and, you know, impart some, like, old sage wisdom about what this neighbor used to be. Um, uh, anyway, this, this image here is from the 6th Street Avenue B uh, Community Garden. Uh, one of my favorite places. I actually want my ashes spread over there you know, when I die. Uh, actually, I have about three gardens I want to be spread across. Uh, but this is one of the main ones. And uh, they do a lot of nighttime events. Uh, uh, I do only, like for my artwork, um, I basically do night photography. I was called another one was a night person. Uh, they're very long exposures. Uh, these people actually sat still for about a minute and just stared at each other's eyes. So I call this one a romance because they just, you know, everybody else is sort of moving around, you know. Uh, you know, and, and they're just, they just like stare at each other and I was like, afterwards I was like, thank you. <laughs> and like, thank you for what? I was like, well, I took this picture and you stayed still for so long. And, um, and so uh, there's something about the night, it just, there's a certain mystique to it. And the East Village to me uh, really comes alive at night, maybe because I spent so much time, you know, I was, I was you know, in a punk band and, we, you know, we pretty much lived you know, from like 8 in the evening to about 4 or 5 in the morning back then. So that's kind of like, you know, it's kind of just was this, this time that was ours. Uh, the East Village was really gritty and dirty, but we really liked it that way. And it really, we felt that it kept the wrong people out. You know? So it was just kind of our place. And it was a really creative place. There was a lot of music and art. And uh, I just loved and reveled in, in uh, what the community was. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Oh, who was the, was the slide? Yeah, right oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, this I call this one East Village Guitar Man. Uh, this was shot about 2008, and uh, uh, I don't do a lot of people. You know, it's, it's, I do a lot of buildings and uh, things like that, and uh, I'm doing a project on the gardens right now. Uh, but uh, you know, once again, it's a long exposure. It's probably about a 30 second exposure. And I'm really interested when, you know, I usually look for someone that's standing still and see how long they can hold it and then let everything else move. So, um, actually this one, no, actually this one's not, uh, this is probably just like, uh, se you know, maybe several seconds exposure just by how, how much the movie is inside. And that's Stromboli's Pizza. Uh, this little stretch of Avenue Way, uh, for a long time, kept its, its, its East Villageness somehow. It was uh, obviously Mark's place and it was still funky and there were, you know, Old stores and things like that, and uh, he just kind of epitomizes a certain 
type of uh, East Villager, you know, with his guitar and his mismatched clothing and, you know, they just kind of love that part of it. Um, you can go on the next one? Okay. Uh, yeah, um, there's really, you know, a few other stores that are iconic is Block Drugs. Uh, as a kid, you know, we probably will stake down this place quite a bit over the years. Uh, yeah, one way to deal with cars is to, you know, let them let the lights kind of flash and, and obscure uh, some of the traffic. Uh, this was after a blizzard, and one night uh, I went out there and I thought it looked like red sherbet, you know, it's like it's <laughs> this delicious looking thing, you know. And uh, uh, the Black Rocks has been there forever, I think it's like early 1900s, uh, something like that. And, uh, you know, it's right up from the Fillmore, and, uh, uh, you know, it's just a, an amazing testament to the. Uh, the, the institutions that are, have been able to survive. So um, anyway, uh, next next slide. Uh, yeah, as I uh, mentioned, there was a, I'm a community gardener. Uh, uh, this is one that's off of 13th Street and is connected to the school next door. And the st uh, students there, uh, you know, have a little greenhouse, and they, you know, there's a lot of kids there that actually uh, have gro have grown up and they have their own kids, and they still come back to garden in this in this garden. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, you know educational revival. It's become the gardens become these environmental science labs. Uh, the garden that I belong to, which is the Children's National Garden, uh, we run a free summer camp program uh, every summer. Uh, we're looking for funding too. Uh, it's called Children's Magical Garden, and you know it really helps kids, uh, families with uh, very limited means, and uh, we have some really great educators. And they, you know there's a lot of um, uh, discourse with um, the neighborhood and the schools, and we bring a lot of kids over. And I know every garden has some sort of education program built in, and the kids, you know, uh, learn about composting and things that they never would uh, have a chance to learn about unless they uh, had these gardens. Uh, to me, these gardens are are like little pockets of like nature fighting back against the concrete, you know. And um, you know, there's buildings that were there, and they were. You know, destroyed, unfortunately. Uh, but now we have to save the gardens, right? Because they're, you know, they're actually what made the neighborhood uh, better for people. They brought up the quality of life. You know, there's, there, uh, like the first one, Sixth Avenue B. I remember when it was just a der derelict lot with co covered in concrete. There's like mounds of concrete. Uh, there was, uh, there was an old garage, and they pulled out cars out of it. And and so, you know, all these, all these um, uh, gardens to me represent. Uh, you know, neighbor people, community coming together and trying to make the place beautiful and more livable and to keep the kids off the streets. So, um, uh, and you know, as you can see, there's a lot of different colored lights. That's what I love about the night is that, you know, there's different uh, temperature lights and I can kind of read, you know, like warm and cool lights and sort of play with it and uh, mess with Photoshop a little bit. And uh, just, you know, I, I'm also a painter, so I, I come, I, my palette really comes from painting. Uh, that's it, that's it. Okay, um, thank you everybody. I'd like to introduce Marlies Mamber. Marlies, come on. Marlies is a photographer, filmmaker who came to the US in 1975 as a fashion photographer and became a resident of Lily Sinem, as well as an impassioned advocate for the LES and one of its most influential chroniclers of life in Lily Sinem, recording the changes that have occurred in her neighborhood in the past 30 years. Her color and black and white photographs have been published in national and international publications used to illustrate articles on political and cultural issues such as gentrification, arts, and culture, Slum lords, uh, arson for hire, squatting, affordable housing, homesteading, drugs, and urban crime. Marlies Mumber. Okay. Uh, I actually came to New York in 1966. Huh? I've been in Manhattan for 50 years. Oh and the first 10 years I was a fashion photographer. I Once a fashion photographer, you're always a fashion photographer. <laughs> but um, I got drawn into the Lower East Side through my lens. And, uh, you know, in 1975, I came back from a trip from Panama and saw my first mule coming over the bridge um, from um, LaGuardia Airport and asked the cab driver to drive by there. They just put it on the mules in, in Panama City. 
So I ain't going there. I said, what do you mean? So I, anyway, I, I drove up to my studio, unloaded all my, my, my assistants, and I said, give me a camera, give me a camera, bless my bicycle, took the bicycle, went back down to Delancey Street, and there was this beautiful mural actually about immigration. I don't know if you remember if it was called, um, I forgot the name. But anyway, I was, I was immediately pulled in, and uh, even though I was still working at the 25th and 5th Avenue beautiful fashion studio, I was a very well known photographer. And um, I started hanging out, you know, all the way on the found all the murals. There was an organization called City Arts Workshop, not to be mixed up with the now existing City Arts, totally different animal. Um, they had no money, and you know, everything was community organized and, and so on. Um, but to jump into it, um, I lived on the right side. This happens to be my son, who is now 37 years old. He just graduated to be a massage therapist. He grew up with epilepsy. Very, very difficult life for both of us. Uh, and now he's a healer. He can heal not himself but other people. I have to mention that because he just graduated as a um, with all kinds of oriental stuff. And, Sorry, this, is fabulous. this is actually not too far away. This is Fifth Street, also a homesteader. Of course, I'm not a resident. I was never a resident. I was always an activist. Okay? And uh, I got involved in homesteading. Um, and since I had this child, um, I was always on the street in the morning to walk to school, in the afternoon walking back, and in between. And I got very involved. All my photographs were taken while I was actually doing something else, going someplace or you know, doing something, but used by all community organizations. The small ones, the big ones, everybody used it. New York Times, and then finally we caught on, and it's all the time. So it was just, um, uh, you know, this land is ours. That was the land. It was an empty lot between 5th and 6th and around the sea. Um, I had one photo, my first photo show at, um, at uh, um, but anyway, I called it 10 years long inside on and off the avenue, and that was basically all shots just on Avenue C. I live on, on 4th Street between B and C, and I've lived in that house for persons 37, so 36 years. Mm -hmm. As a homestead, uh, under pressure, uh, as many of our homesteads are, the city now, under the HPD, just included us back into their. Um, trying to restructure it because all the homes that went belly up by people getting greedy and renting their apartments with options to buy, market rate, which is totally out of order. This is not, our miners are, you know, it's really, really horrible. In the beginning, people were giving $10,000. What are you going to do with $10,000? You can't find anything. You can't even make a deposit on a, on a now, you know, so-called affordable apartment. Then six months before this, and who knows what. But anyway, it was a fierce fight. Um, and when you rode against us with motorbikes and horses, finally uh, the squatters on 13th Street with tanks. And this was all preserving ruins, basically. The, we bought our building in 1977, 310th 4th Street. The city didn't even know there was a building on it. We did pay $500 for it. Some people paid nothing or a dollar. Okay. Um, it was 36 um, uh, apartments were in there. They obviously were all little holes, you know, elevated building. You know, of course, I picked the building because I was pregnant when I when I joined the homestead and I didn't want to walk up, <laughs> but I wanted the top floor, of course, or something similar. You know. So it took us only two years to homestead the building and make 16 beautiful apartments, duplexes, three bedrooms, two bedroom studios, and one bedrooms. 16 apartments, 16 families, and we were tight. We were like one family. Okay. Uh, our first Christmas, uh, when we moved in in 1980, we had a CFO because the inspector who came was this uh, very um, corpulent guy, and the elevator didn't work. It worked, but he made it not normal. Okay. So he didn't walk up because of the CFO <laughs> inspecting the first floor. There were two studios, and, and and one 
one bedroom and one duplex. And you didn't even go up, the duplex had like a staircase like that you go up there, of course, you know. So we had our seal off, that was it. And we had Christmas with open doors and mostly um, in the um, Afro-Americans, uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, uh, I was at the time called La Monica Blanca. And um, it was just like one big family. That feeling has definitely changed. Okay? People got greedy, people moved out, people died also. The people, apartments became available. The administrations of the building was is corrupt. Um, we are in court, and uh, what are we going to say? So, is there another photo? Okay, so anyway, oh wow. Uh, this is a lousy, lousy, lousy um, production or something like that. You know? mm -hmm. Is this the, actually what you had to work with for the book? Mm -hmm. I, I worked from a color oh, print. God, that is horrible. <laughs> but anyway, it's a gorgeous photograph um, uh, taken on the East River Park. Um, the El Bujillo, Charles El Bujillo organized uh, these beautiful um, uh, festivals over there. You know, all the events with cookouts and stuff. It was really, really wonderful. But of course, there wasn't a lot going on except of drugs and so on. I aprendí la lengua en la calle, pero you know, this neighborhood was totally Spanish. So now I'm trying I mean, to learn Arabic. And it's uh, impossible. <laughs> Because there's no Latin root to that. <laughs> oh, there's, it won't have any roots to it, but of course there are. So these are all community activists, all the dancers, all the musicians, all the. Uh, this is Gary Cruz, who now is uh, instrumental in um, uh, putting out a um, documentary about my work and about my life. And he is, you know, just a dancer and, a, and an actor and everything else. And he's now heading. Um, Film crew, and they are all over me, and it's mm -hmm. incredible. So, I've been photographing for 40 years, um, and not, you know, hired for a day or for a story. Um, I was going out to photograph for all the publications, the uh, quality of life of Sire, by the world publication in the 80s. Can I have another photo, please? Because I don't know what's coming up. Okay, here, that is wonderful. Typicamente, this is a platform that we build. It's rather high. The kids have to really climb up. This is now, of course, um, called, called El Hadin or the. Um, um, sorry. Anyway, it's Fifth Street, Fifth Street um, between C and D. Um, this um, public housing were built after they were going to build another project, just like an you did, you know, eight stories high and all that kind of stuff. They couldn't get all. The river flows through it. The whole way inside, there was used to be a river. And this is part of the riverbed. And to this day, these little three stories, tiny buildings compared to, the, I mean, this is a four, four story, very, very, the old building in the early 1900s, I mean, 1900 something, or 1890 or so. Um, they still have sump pumps in the basement. Okay? <laughs> yeah, because the river, you know, the whole way inside was one big swamp. You know, there was no embankment of the river, and so uh, I did a story on, I photographed slavery in New York City, and I found it so much on Madison Street. They had um, the, um, and upstairs, where they kept the slaves in chains while the sun was going on downstairs. And I could not believe it, but then I dug into it, and you know, so I was totally involved. Everything I saw, I explored and photographed, and, and you know, again, sucked in by my lens, you know. Um, another photo. And this is just the, yeah. And this is in our front of the supermarket on Four Street. And I will see this is a woman who was there for 20 years with her kitchen and made uh, traditional uh, Puerto Rican rice and beans and uh, papas and you know wonderful. I could send my son down there with a dollar and he come back and have a lunch. And, um, uh, but she. She was she was chased down by people who didn't like that. Like for example, um, you know she didn't have a license, of course. You know, but that was all a very spontaneous thing. That was also part of the economy. She wasn't even the one. There were lots of things like this going on. You know, all the ice cream men was all that stuff. When the licensing came on, I mean, we used to be able to throw a street a block party just like that. When the licensing came up. It became a little bit more difficult you know, to do that, you know. 
but Lauer was just a picture of the street. This was a beautiful mural, a full a whole supermarket called Afro Latin mural, and with uh, five, seven youth gangs who got them together and said, instead of fighting each other, why don't we help our community? And they did it. Chil Garcia is one probably best known of your I'm missing. I see nobody here who was relevant at the time. I might overlook a couple. Amy! Woo! <laughs> 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 Oh my God, thank you so much, Ah, oh, wow, I'm just shaking now. So, because it was wild. I mean, I got arrested. I spent New Year's Eve, the first uh, of January of 1986, in jail downtown. I was arrested in my own apartment where there was a drug deal going on on New Year's Eve, and I was throwing eggs from my first floor apartment because they were just there. The, 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 the cops were right on Fifth Street because all the blocks were walks through. You know, you could just, you didn't have to go to the corner and put the walk straight to the block. And anyway, it is a fabulous, fabulous story that I have, all in pictures. And actually, Leslie has my oral history, right? Liza Zepo? What I, think you it, I think it's GBSHP. Oh, yeah, it's the other. It's the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Really, yeah. I'm sorry. So anyway, they have a three hour. Uh, my, my rambling on like I do. Uh, is that another one? No, that's it. Thank you so much. that I still have to put together between now and then. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to be on the street and I'm selling um, vintage prints, which mm -hmm. are very, very good. Oh, it's here too. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you so much. I want to really get a uh, big round of applause for Marilyn and Marlies and Ono and George and Karen uh, for a really wonderful presentation. I just want to say that, you know, we, we talk about preservation as an abstract thing, but when we walk around the streets, sometimes we take for, for granted our urban environment, the history that we see all around us, because it's been there for so long and we think it's going to stay there forever. But it's not necessarily going to stay there forever. In fact, it's really under quite heavy assault right now from developers. So that's why it's so important for us all to band together and to try to work to preserve our neighborhood and preserve the history here that's not only important to us personally, but really is a world history, a history of immigration, a history of art, a history of literature and culture. Um, and uh, we were, were so lucky to be able to band together with Grand Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and with Historic Districts Council and with East Village Community Coalition, Bowery, Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, to, to make um, the first East Village Historic Districts. Now we're working with GBH, um, GBS HP very closely to um, get a new district or extended districts passed in the East Village. So I do want to say that we have some of these uh, beautiful uh, Lens on the Lower East Side East Village uh, books for sale here. Uh, Marilyn's been kind enough to offer to uh, sign them. And, or not. Uh, or not, or not. And um, you saw a representative sampling of, of the photographs, but we have more photo photographers. And they're $20, $18 for lesbian members, $20 for non-members. And um, the, the, you just saw a sampling of the beautiful photographs here. So it's really a wonderful book. You have to read Marilyn's text to believe it. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. <laughs>